All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, if you are brand new, I still see that there are people piling in. Definitely don't hesitate to jump on and let us know where you guys are tuning in from. Um, we're going to have a full hour of jumping into multimodal. If you have any questions throughout that, definitely take advantage uh, by letting us know below. So with that, we're going to get started. All right. Today, we are here to talk about demystifying multimodal design. So really diving into what is the background of these multi-screens, how visuals, how chat, how voice intermix, and we're here today with Cheryl Platts. So if you are new here, welcome. This is a series of webinars that is run by VoiceFlow. We are a tool that allows people to easily design a prototype and launch conversation experiences for just about any channel, making it easy for anybody, whether you're technical, non-technical, copywriter, designer, to really collaborate and build together. And today we're really, really focused on being able to decentralize that, make that easy for everybody. And if you have any questions, whether it is jumping onto the product, getting questions or wanting to talk with Cheryl or seeing some previous events that we've had, don't hesitate to check us out on our channels below. However, today um, we have a very special guest that is not only an incredible mind in the world of multimodal and conversation design, but also one of the best-selling authors in this space itself. So if you are enjoying what is going on today, feel free to head over to Twitter and let us know what you're thinking, any questions, any remarks, tagging voice low within it. And we're gonna be selecting some winners to get a copy of Cheryl's book, Design Beyond Devices. So a great way of diving even further into multimodal design. Beyond that, hi everybody, my name is Emily. Uh, if you have not met me before, I am the head of growth over at VoiceFlow and I am joined today by the one and only Cheryl Platts, uh, who is an author as well as a founder and principal at Idea Platts. She is an expert in multimodal design, conversation design, and has most recently been working with the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation on some of their conversation design experiences. So with that, I'm going to pass over the reins to Cheryl to give us a quick little intro. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. It's wonderful to see such a global crowd. And thank you for the introduction, Emily. Uh, and uh, so excited to be here this time of day. From such a global crowd, I will not attempt to assign one. Um, I'm just going to take a moment and uh, share my screen before I forget so that we are ready to go. And then uh, that way my captions are working. So hopefully if folks need that, those are available as well. Fun fact, that's free in PowerPoint. They did not pay me to say that. Just from an accessibility standpoint, that's a free feature that's just been sitting there. Um, but as Emily mentioned, I am Cheryl Platts. Uh, I have worn many hats, uh, author, designer, uh, actress. I did lots of things. Um, let's click into PowerPoint so we can get started. Before we begin, it's Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, uh, this past Monday, uh, in the United States. So I wanted to acknowledge that this talk is being delivered within the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe. Uh, despite hundreds of years of broken treaties and setbacks, the Duwamish people continue to shine a light here in their ancestral lands as the hoped tribe of Seattle, all while they continue to petition for formal government recognition. I am grateful to the Duwamish tribe, past and present, and honor their land themselves. And it's a little emotional because I think this is the last time I will be <laughs> giving that one because I am leaving Seattle uh, this year. This is probably the last time I'm going to give that one. Did not expect that, so we're going to move on from there. But uh, thank you. Um, I am actually leaving the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation this month uh, to take on a new role as director of user experience uh, for the player platform at Riot Games. That's a hard left uh, from philanthropy, and we could, we could talk for an hour about that, but we're just going to keep moving on. Uh, so uh, some of the context for why I'm talking to you today and why I'm passionate about multimodal design. Uh, a couple of the projects I've worked on, I was the original UX designer on the Echo Look team at Amazon, which was a multimodal device that had hardware components, an app, and voice. Uh, was the original designer for the Alexa notifications feature, which you see all across the Alexa platform today, and worked also on the launch of the Echo, uh, Echo Show. And I've done voice systems and multimodals design on Alexa, Cortana, Windows Automotive, and for Dynamics Power Virtual Agents. I also shipped one of the first speech-enabled Nintendo uh, DS games, Disney Friends, way, way back in the day. And I've created several Alexa skills in my free time. So 
uh, passionate about both conversational design and my multimodal design, which is why we're here. And, uh, you know, Bill Bison and I have talked about, are both passionate about multimodality, and we both agree on this point, that the future is multimodal because humans are multimodal. This talk is multimodal. I'm speaking to you, and you're taking in visual stimuli. Uh, this isn't a radio talk. It's a, it's a Zoom talk, and so you've got these stimuli to take in. A mode in the context of this talk is a type of communication, and humans communicate using their senses. Now, uh, we take in communication using our senses. I don't mean I somehow project my talk to you with my vision, but you know what we mean in this context. A multimodal interaction is an exchange between a device and a human being where multiple input or output modalities can be used simultaneously or sequentially, depending upon context and preference. So sometimes you're using them multiple, but they're using multiple at once, and sometimes you're allowing people the flexibility to choose. Both of those are forms of multimodal design. Now, multimodal design is, uh, the way I define it is, as multimodal design seeks to coordinate the delivery of multiple input and output stimuli to create a flexible, coherent experience for our customers. Now, when we practice multimodal design, it's an additional layer of design rigor on top of the existing modality-specific designs like voice UI designs that you're all working on, or or conversational designs if you're doing uh, if you're doing chatbot-specific work. Uh, you're this is an additional layer. You are not replacing the work you're already doing. You're adding it. Job security. <laughs> There's always more uh, more complexity. Now. If you look at the subtitle of my book, I actually, it, it's a subtitled Creating Multimodal Cross-Device Experiences. And it would have been a much shorter book if I had just kind of scoped it further, but why include both multimodal and cross-device experiences? Wasn't, wasn't just multimodality complicated enough? But I feel strongly that it's short-sighted to assume any experience exists in a vacuum, like our customers are swimming in devices, even our websites are cross-device now, they function on desktop and mobile, which means that interruption, context, and notifications become relevant. And so the limits on, of multimodality of one device may cause a customer to turn to another device. If we think about looking at this from a humanistic perspective, if a customer is saying, I really want to interact with this with touch because voice no longer works for me, and you have a voice only experience, this has become a cross device situation. They're going to move to a device that's going to allow them to continue with touch uh, or you know keyboard or whatever the appropriate interaction modality is. So looking at this, these two sort of as twins makes sense because humans are going to look at them in a continuum. So today in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about multimodal design fundamentals. I'm going to talk to you about an approach for capturing customer context, which is really important when making informed multimodal design decisions. We're going to talk about this, the uh, strategy around designing for transitions, which is one thing we don't talk about when doing modality specific designs. And then we'll talk a little bit about the techniques around adding visuals to voice uh, or to conversation design in general. And it's okay if you're not a conversational or voice design expert. Um, you know, a lot of this is, uh, if you're new to the field, a lot of this is systems design work. And you, this is something you can keep with you as you grow into the field. So let's talk about multimodal design fundamentals. So just, this may be wrote for some folks, but just make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, I'm going to talk about five communication modalities. These are the ones I reference in my book. Uh, we don't map directly to the five senses because, I, as I mentioned, we don't actually communicate like with with our eye. I mean, Tyra Banks would tell us we communicate with our eyes. She's like smiles, you know, just communicate with smile with your eyes. But in reality, there's communication modalities. Um, we're we're trying to convey information in a way that it can be processed by senses, and so. Uh, the modalities I discuss in my book are um, visual communication modality, uh, so stimulus that can be uh, interpreted over optical channels. Uh, you're interpreting my slides over an optical channel right now. Auditory communication modality, and that's not just speech, uh, but it can be music or sound effects as well. There's the haptic communication modality, which is communicating meaning with changes to the physical environment. Uh, so when you're typing or uh, you're clicking a mouse button, this can also be stuff that's a little bit less uh, less common. 
uh, force feedback uh, so there's systems like there's systems that like blow air on you if you're playing a video game in an arcade uh, that's also haptic feedback uh, in a way so there's this is a really interesting category and then the last two are a little bit more interesting they don't necessarily directly map to senses in the way that the first three do so it takes a little bit more creativity to think about Kinetic communication is communication based on movement or orientation in space. And uh, a lot of you, your brain has immediately moved correctly to something like the Xbox Kinect. Uh, the, the communication is not the position of the body, it's the way the body moved. Um, the same is true about uh, you know, our gesture communication on our phones is kinetic. It's not the, where the, the finger is, it's how the finger moved. When we use pen as an input technique or a mouse as an input technique, the, if we're clicking, that's really a haptic interaction. It's just about that point in time. But if we're moving and we're like trying to write in cursive, suddenly that's more of a kinetic interaction because it's the movement that matters. It's the journey that matters. Uh, now, the last category we don't talk about a lot, and <laughs> this one I sort of created for the book uh, to en encapsulate things that we don't necessarily directly see or manipulate, but have an impact uh, it, and uh, can it either we can infer meaning from them or can, can communicate meaning to us. Uh, and this is the ambient category, and this can be things like smell. Uh, and it can also be things like presence, uh, it can be sensors, heart rate, things that we're not even consciously putting out into the world. Um, you know, a great example of an ambient communication is the uh, sulfuric smell that's placed into a natural gas. Uh, that's an ambient communication. Uh, and you know, another example, of, and we've got tons of examples of ambient communication that are going on if you own a smartwatch. Now, this seems like a big space. There's five of those communication modalities described and you're probably picturing infinite numbers of possibilities. And when you think about how to start placing your potential experience, whether you have a chatbot or a conversation, a voice agent or something like that into a multimodal context, maybe it's a little daunting. How do you know, is it something, do you wanna put it on an Alexa device? Uh, do you want to put it on a smartwatch? You know, not all these experiences are created equally if you've, if you've been sort of a student of the space. But the good news is during my time working on these experiences, I found that there's actually only really two dimensions that fundamentally drive the core decisions about where these experiences make the most sense. And those two dimensions are things, these two dimensions here. So how rich is your information? And how close is the device to the customer? What is the physical relationship between the customer and the device typically? So information density uh, in, in your scenario, is it something that's, is it low information density? Like a, you know, like you might see on a smartwatch or wearable. So this is stuff like a temperature. Uh, it could be a sports score or something like that. Or is it something that, uh, that is more high density that, that requires a lot more space or requires a lot more, uh, fidelity a uh, book a uh, video uh, not just a particular temperature but the 10-day forecast uh, you know that that requires a different type of experience maybe an ephemeral experience with no visuals is not the right place to put that content on the other side of, of this uh, two-dimension spectrum is the relationship between the customer and the device um, when you're thinking about your customer and how they're probably going to interact with your brand or service and what devices or device they have near them, uh, what is the relationship they have with that device? Is it uh, typically close to them? Uh, or is it typically far from them? Or is it flexible? Can they interact with it from a distance? Or it, is it something that's, that's really just sort of attached to them all the time? And you, the way we get to these answers is through understanding our customer's context. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But once you get the answers to these two questions reliably and once you understand what problem you're trying to solve for your customers you can take your potential experience and place it within the spectrum of multimodality and so here i've plotted the uh, those two dimensions we've got the, the customer's potential proximity to the device on the horizontal axis and the density of the information on the vertical axis 
And so we've got these four quadrants that represent four archetypes of multimodal interactions that you see on the market today. And by understanding your customer's relationship with their device and the types of scenarios that you're going to need to present to them, you can figure out which sort of corner of the market may make most sense for you to lead with. Now, you may also find that multiple corners of the market make sense. Uh, we'll talk about these corners in more detail, but just as an overview right now, we've got uh, up in the upper right hand corner, we have adaptive, which is sort of the holy grail. These are experiences that can work both at close range or at far range and ideally allow customers to choose in their own time. Uh, then, you know, sort of moving counterclockwise, since that's the way of, uh, <laughs> graphs are apparently numbered. These and some things about math I'll never understand, and that is one of them. Uh, now, uh, quadrant two, anchored. These are experiences where the customer's relationship with the device, uh, you know, is they're they're typically they they have to go to the device, and the device usually has a physical presence. The fact that the device is stuck in one place usually means that it can have bigger screens, that it has power, uh, that there's more to it. And this is things like your television. Uh, direct experiences are things like my smartwatch. And then intangible experiences are probably things that many of you are very familiar with, like our friend Alexa or OK Google, our, our voice assistants, our ephemeral experiences don't really have a visual component necessarily. Or if they do, it's not something that's primary to the experience. But to know where you want to put your experience on that spectrum, you have to understand your customer's context. And that context really matters. And the thing is, the way we may have approached research before uh, may have made some we may have made some assumptions about, you know, everybody's living room was the same. We may have made some assumptions about uh, we may have just not asked detailed questions about the way people's lives worked, uh, how their kitchens worked, uh, where they were going, how often they changed rooms. And those questions now matter if we're trying to figure out whether it makes sense to invest in a multimodal experience at all, which is a common question from stakeholders. Uh, one of my most popular Medium articles was about uh, why the fact that a lot of voice experiences are often added to, uh, the most popular voice experiences solved problems that had already been solved by apps, uh, but they were solving them in ways that uh, helped people uh, in situations where the context meant the previous solution wasn't helpful. You know, we talk about uh, kitchen timers. Yeah, there were apps for that, but your hands are covered in food. So why do you want to touch your thousand dollar phone when you do that? Uh, the only way Amazon or uh, discovered that was really investigating the way people lived and asking detailed questions. And so that's why the next thing I want to talk to you about is capturing customer context, asking really deep and detailed questions about uh, your customers and how they live. And this means possibly challenging deeply held beliefs about the way your customers operate. And, you know, everything, the, the thing is, this is a really good time to do this because in the last year or two, what we thought we knew about the world has changed. Uh, either the assumption that everybody's homes are the same, right? Like we've been doing teleconferencing for how long and like how many different home office setups have you seen? No one's home offices are the same. There are so many different potential setups. Um, you know, there's and then there's like normal ways of working and living that are being challenged. Are whiteboards and stickies really the holy grail of creativity when we're in a hybrid world? and People can't share that physical experience or people don't want to touch the same things because they're uh, <laughs> there's a risk of infection. You know, so we've all learned there's no such thing as a typical home office. We need to ask deeper questions. We need to avoid these big assumptions. So what I uh, teach in my book and uh, I have found helps me in is using a storytelling shorthand, uh, we use it in my improv theater, uh, Unexpected Productions, it, which in Seattle performs in the Pike Place Market. Fun fact, it's the reason the gum wall exists, which is on the list of, uh, is the second germiest attraction in the world, which you know used to be a fun fact, and now it takes on a new meaning in the middle of a pandemic. I still haven't fully unpacked that, but um, when, when you're being paid to perform for people, there's a special kind of pressure because they expect the scene to be interesting. And we've, over the years, we've found, you know, one of our previous improvisers 
came up with this shorthand for what are the basic components we need to convey to audience members for their brains to be able to fill in the rest and find it a believable and interesting scene. And so CROW stands for character, relationship, objective, and where. And as a improviser slash designer, I was like, well, you know, this is also kind of a roadmap to what, uh, what elements help us flesh out what makes, what takes a sort of, sort of roughly sketched out customer and starts to make them a fully defined human individual. Uh, and it can be a reminder to us what questions we want to ask. And so uh, just to dig into these four elements a little bit, uh, for character, uh, the way I teach character to my improv students is it's a, it, I take this from a book called The Improv Handbook, and I really like this, this breakdown, but uh, it's, it, they break this, it, the concept of character down into attributes, attitudes, and choices. So what defines your customer? There are attributes, which are like fundamental traits, mannerisms, and habits, the things that are unlikely to change. Now, sometimes things re like things that are fundamental do change you know we we go through an epiphany and our preferred pronouns change or something like that or you know last year i was diagnosed with a disability i didn't know i'd had and i've been living with my whole life so you know i became a member of a community of disability community i didn't know i was a part of uh, but in general these these attributes tend to be slow moving if at all and you know the kinds of questions you might try to ask customers are you know how do they define their identity to other people you can ask it in fun ways like how would you write your twitter bio you, you know how would you convey yourself uh, you know what's your elevator pitch to other people what do they feel is most important about themselves that, that themselves that they want other people to know there's attitudes which are their, that person's emotions and reactions to outside stimuli other people objects or situations and this is important for us to understand when we think about what are the preconceived opinions or uh, learned behaviors that people are going to bring to bear, you know, <laughs> or not bring to bear. You know, what what are people's attitudes towards the little save disk icon, right? <laughs> um, but there are a lot of more meaningful examples than that. And then choices, the actions you take based on your beliefs and attitudes. Why would a customer choose to seek out your experience at all? Did they have a choice at all? And these are the sorts of things we can get to with, uh, you know, more observational techniques with ethnographic work, you know, job shadows or, you know, uh, that contextual inquiries, that sort of thing. Now, relationships, the R in Crow, talk about what connects your customer. The closer you are to something or someone, the more likely you are to get emotional about it. So relationships drive satisfaction and frustration. So we want to understand what those, those ties are. Um, we, we're probably pretty familiar with our human to business connections, like how your customer feels about your brand, the market conditions, their expectations and perceptions. But we might not be asking detailed questions about the customer's relationship to the device they're working with. Ask questions like, do they own the device or are they using someone else's device? Have they anthropomorphized it? You know, that when when people start to name their device or use it as a personal self-expression, uh, self that creates a sense of emotional attachment. That means if you mess with it, if you break it, that's going to amplify all of the emotions surrounding that incident. Uh, and so, and you know, how much money have they invested in the device that your experience is showing up on? It's important that we understand these things and respect those relationships. And another thing we don't really dig into is human to human relationships that surround our products. We really focus on the customer to business and the customer to product relationship. But what about the other people in the room? If you're doing voice design, you're probably asking these questions, but uh, it's tough when there's someone else blurting out something in the middle of a sentence when you're trying to talk to Alexa. Uh, but you know, what are there people cooperatively, cooperatively trying to use your product? Uh, or sequentially, you know, if there's a shared desktop in a house that has an impact on uh, the way the system runs, how apps are installed, um, how, you know, and anytime multiple customers are, uh, are involved, you have to start asking questions about trust. Do those individuals trust each other? Uh, how do they express their identity? You know, the whole Netflix situation when people are sharing profiles, is it, are they they're using separate profiles? Are they all using the same timeline? You know, that whole ramp from everybody sharing one Netflix profile to having individual profiles, they had to ask human to human questions to get to that insight. And then the sense of competition. Uh, this is a very powerful motivator, the whole sort of 
quote unquote gamification fad uh, uh, that sort of came and went. Underlying that is a very valid behavioral change me uh, mechanic, which is humans are motivated by competition with other humans. So who are they? Mot who do they want to be like? Who are they driven to compete with? And what? How can you use that for positive change or positive motivation in their lives? Or how is their competition with others negatively impacting your product? And then the O is about what drives your customer. What have you defined as your customer's objective? Now, ideally, this is preaching to the choir. We are hopefully identifying what our customer's goals are. Uh, you know, we have our user stories and our scenarios. Uh, but this is a good reminder to make sure that the goals we've identified are truly our customer's end goals and not simply sentences written to get our customers to the features. You know, my big pet peeve when I was working on server software was when we'd be like, uh, customer browses the list of servers. I'm like, well, nobody recreationally, bra recreationally browses a list of servers. That's not, <laughs> it's not a fun thing. They, they're going to find, in this case, to find whether or not they need to go find the virtual machine that crashed. Uh, and there's other people who come to browse for other reasons. And that's the way we need to frame this. Uh, and making sure that your product team uh, has not assumed that their solution stands alone is so important. Uh, in, in our app-driven mobile world, it's so common that we just think about our app beginning and ending there, but there's so much happening outside. Uh, take a step back and think about the larger device agnostic human objective that might span multiple experiences. In some cases, you might find that it takes some scope off your plate. Uh, in some cases, it might explain failures because it's explaining some of those preconceived notions if we come back to the character problem question up front. And one thing that we should always remember when we come to objective is don't obstruct objective. <laughs> Timing and context matter when considering customer objective. Even if you're offering something of value later, you might be obstructing a objective in the moment. You know, and I think in our hearts, we all know this and, and we get ourselves obstructed when trying to prevent these sorts of obstructions. It's like obstruction inception, but the O in Crow is also a reminder that if someone comes to our site, they, um, they, they want to do something. They, uh, and you know, these pop-ups, this example of a pop-up from Nielsen Norman, where it's, can you keep a secret? I did not come to this website to keep a secret uh, that has nothing to do with my objective. And uh, we want to be supporting the objective. And if we're not supporting the objective, wait. And you know, once people are done, then you can come in with ancillary stuff. And you know, we fight these battles too. Like we have a newsletter pop up on my uh, on my theaters page that I'm still working to figure out like how we can come to a better solution on. But uh, at least the newsletter provides a link to show information where keeping a secret is not at all directly related to uh, my goal of buying furniture. So the where, the W in, in Crow, is what surrounds your customer. And this one, I think, is probably the trickiest one because we were living in this world where we could just assume that everybody kind of had the same sort of open plan office space or everybody had this kind of generic living room. Or uh, I think whether or not it was true, I feel like there were, we, we, we didn't ask a lot of tough questions in general about the where, about how our experiences were being used. And so there's a lot of fertile ground here. And when we're talking about devices that can move between spaces, when we're talking about uh, hands-free experiences, uh, when we don't know whether a customer is gonna look at our device or we're trying to justify to our, <laughs> our stakeholders the investment in a multimodal experience, the where is really important. Where will your customer be when they wanna interact with you? Will they be seated or standing or moving? What's in arm's reach? What devices will be available like if there's always a phone or a remote near you maybe voice interaction isn't going to be people's first choice and so multimodality makes sense in that context if you already have voice but they're just always going to have touch near them being able to scale between those things makes sense who else will be in those environments are there distractions will customers continue Will customers expect to continue this experience between locations or devices all of these are really important questions so I've created a bunch of resources for you if this is kind of new or if you're not necessarily, don't consider yourself part of the research side of the discipline. 
Uh, there's both uh, printable worksheets if you work better in paper or you find yourself going back to the office. Um, there's four worksheets here, creating a shared understanding baseline, helping you visualize context by doing some sketch exercises, capturing Crow, brainstorming about what elements may be in play. And then the fourth worksheet is around open research questions you may want to add to your existing research workflow. Uh, this, whole, um, th this whole process, uh, I recommend in my book that a shared understanding workshop as a way of bringing your stakeholders on board. Because when I was working on projects like the Echo Look, we were often asked, well, why include voice? You can just have an app. And so we really had to bring our customers' context to life and we had to challenge preconceived notions that our, that our stakeholders had. They felt they understood our customers. They felt that uh, our customers always has had a phone with them. And so we had to kind of get them into the room and say like, hey, yeah, so our customers, they, like in the beginning of the day, their phone's plugged in or it's in the bedroom and now they've gone to the closet and they're making a clothing choice and their phone is not necessarily with them. And also what do you do with your phone when you're changing your clothes? So shared understanding workshops help get everybody putting what they think they know on a table and then working towards what do we still not know and what do we think we, we need to go further on. Also available on my site is, um, I think there's a typo in that, uh, that bit, we have to see DC, but we can get the, get the links out to everybody uh, corrected. But there's also a mural template for a, a capturing customer context workshop if you are doing digital stuff. And there's an interview guide with Crow inspired questions that you can layer onto your existing research process as well. Uh, and they're broken out like by character, device relationship and that sort of thing. So resources, and you don't need to purchase the book to have access to these resources, they are public. So you understand your customer's context, what changes about the design process in multimodal and cross-device design. So the thing is, if we've all learned to do visual design or voice design, you know what we haven't learned to do is to move between them. And so that's, that's one of the biggest part. There are a lot of things that we won't have time to talk about today, but I think one of the most fundamental that I wanted to talk about here was transition strategy. Uh, the, the, it's the falling between the cracks, is being intentional about that moving between the different dedicated modalities. Transitions will make or break your multimodal experience. We're so used to designing for the moments when things are fixed, but what about the shifts? And shifts don't have to be just uh, between modality and modality. They can also be between network connections, between devices. There are all kinds of uh, shifts. Um, in your customer's world, there's also transitions between spaces. So when we talk about transitions between modalities, it's also important to talk about what kind of a transition it is from the customer's perspective. So we have voluntary transitions between modalities and involuntary transitions between modalities. So sometimes I'm like, you know what, you know, we're going back to the kitchen example. I don't want to, you know, I know, well, let's say the, the, I, when I was working on Cortana and I was doing, um, calendar invitations you could start with voice but sometimes corrections were just too time consuming to do with voices so you might touch the screen and that is a voluntary modality switch from voice to touch on the flip side an involuntary switch is when the system can no longer continue in the current modality and sends you to a different modality uh, you know, this happened a lot on Xbox where you'd, uh, you'd be doing something in voice and it'd say, you know, pick up the controller to move on. And you see this on the iPhone sometimes when you work with Siri and you ask Siri to perform a search and uh, she's like, well, here's what I got. And she's basically directing you to web results on the screen. Uh, now, the key with volu involuntary uh, transitions is you need to provide that context. And with voluntary uh, transitions, you kind of need to help people understand that that's possible. So pay special attention to your input and output cliffs. So cliffs are the rough edges between interactions. Ideally, you're helping bridge the uh, <laughs> those interactions instead of people just sort of falling off the edge. Uh, so an input transition is when people are transitioning between two or more input modalities in a single activity. So that's, you know, me talking about uh, the Xbox example where I'm speaking to it and suddenly I need to pick up the controller. Uh, an output transition is the example I just gave with Siri where uh, it's speaking to me and now it directs my attention to the screen because the actual answer to my question is on the screen. 
uh, well, actually, that's the input output. Uh, uh, that's the output transition. And then an input output mismatch is where I speak to the I speak to a system and it doesn't give me an acoustic response. It gives me a visual response. So um, it's just it doesn't uh, it doesn't match me at all. Um, I can make a visual request, a verbal request, and it gives me a visual answer. And those are especially difficult because you have to <laughs> you have to hope that the customers aware that this mismatch is occurring like how are you going to get their attention to that other to that other modality network connection transitions are another place where we lose a lot of trust i don't know how many of you remember the old behavior of the exchange app in uh in uh on ios but they've gotten a little bit better but it used to say that when, when it couldn't find connection you'd open up the app uh, it would say no messages found, like inbox empty, which is not the way we want to be handling our internet transitions. Uh, you know, this is a device, you know, maybe you're moving between devices, maybe you're moving between network connections, but we, we want to understand the experience customers have when they're moving between these experiences, whether it's an intentional connection loss, unstable connection, insufficient connection, proximity loss, connection failure. Uh, it's no better way to freak someone out than tell, making them think their entire inbox has disappeared. Uh, this is a much better message that they've added now, your device is offline. So being aware of device uh, connection uh, stats. And if you're somebody who's working with voice, you're probably a little bit more aware of network connection as it is because oftentimes our voice interactions don't work super well when network connection is not available. But that means that network connection transitions are super important for us. How are we communicating that? Uh, it's not always great, Alexa, that experience when it has failed over. Uh, and, and it's not an easy problem to solve. Do you interrupt people and tell them, oh, oh, my internet's down? Um, or do you just yell at them with the red, uh, with the red lights when they try to interact with you? Like, what, what is the right solution? And then why enable transitions between devices as opposed to modalities? You know, there's all kinds of reasons why uh, you might want to extend your transition strategy, commuting, traveling, mealtime, exercise, daytime, nighttime shifts. You know, sometimes some devices are surrounded in glare and you've just got to move. Um, and device suitability. Some people, you know, phones are just not as great for data entry as uh, anchored experiences. Uh, physical comfort, temporary interference, multitasking. There's all kinds of reasons why we might not just want to stop with allowing people to move back and forth between voice and touch. So there are a couple of common directed transition archetypes where uh, the customer is telling you that they want to move to something, do something else uh, to, to change the terms of the interaction. Environmental being the customer is moving between physical spaces like i'm interacting with this alexa and now i'm interacting with that alexa device preference you know i have multiple ways to complete a task you know i'm work i'm you know looking at a presentation here and now i'm going to move to my pc because i need to edit it um you know or, or I, I guess to look at i'll use i'll use the example for uh the pre, for viewing a presentation as more device preference so i'm looking at my presentation and it's just too small here so i'm going to go look at my uh, pc to view it, but device suitability might be looking at the presentation here and deciding I need to edit it, so I'm going to go to my PC for that. But let's talk about adding visuals to voice, which is probably what a lot of you have questions about. What does your customer see when they're interacting with your device, and how will your chosen interaction model impact your design? So you're still going to need to do full visual designs for multimodal experiences if you've chosen a model that has visuals. And all of the quadrants typically have some form of visuals. Because if we're just doing audio, if we're just doing visuals, we are probably leaving someone behind. We are probably not being fully inclusive. Uh, and what we don't want is to just swing the pendulum all the way the other way. Like, you know, early in the development of computers, it was all visual and people who had visual disabilities were left behind. We don't want to end up in a world where it's all audio and people with visual disabilities are left behind. So we kind of want a world where we have multiple options. So you're, surprisingly, your choice of visuals should be informed by your microphones. <laughs> So if you have far field microphones and they are working as such, so you're allowing people to interact at a distance, you can't assume the customer is looking at the device. So visuals shouldn't be required to complete key tasks. 
So uh, your choice, uh, the way your visuals interact with your, uh, uh, your prompts is going to be different than in a world where you have near field microphones, which really assume that your customer is near or touching the device, in which case they can probably always see the visuals. In those cases, you can get away with having some of the required information on the screen and then have the voice be supplemental. So knowing which interaction model you've chosen uh, for your device influences how you're going to choose to build the relationship between your vi visuals and your voice prompts. And, you know, bringing back this graph just as a reminder, um, this is uh, uh, this is the spectrum of multimodality we have. I have a question in there, how about AirPods, which allow you to be far from the device? They allow you to be far from the core device, but the AirPods themselves are in direct contact with the customer. So for me, if the customer has AirPods, um, as uh, that's a really interesting question. If the AirPods are here and I'm able to, you know, with me, and I'm able to complete interactions without like touching the device in any way, then it's probably more of an intangible interaction if the visuals are physically separated from me. Um, if the AirPods are here and I still need to touch stuff, then you're functionally still having an anchored experience. So uh, just to kind of diving a little bit deeper on these quadrants for you, um, Adaptive experiences are like the Echo Show, the Google Nest Hub, etc. They generally support both close and far scenarios, and they're completable remotely. They but proximity, proximity unlocks new options. So ideally with these, you should be able to do everything you want to do from far away. But if you come close, maybe you get extra information. Customers can choose how to interact in some or all situations. Now, my caveat here is my vision for this quadrant is people can choose to do uh, touch or visual for any uh, scenario. But the way these pretty much function right now is you have to start with voice for all scenarios. Uh, for almost all scenarios. Like there's no menu to browse to see everything that Alexa does. And I understand why uh, Alexa does a ton and have menu for that would be crazy. Uh, but so they're not fully adaptive, uh, but uh, you, you do need to start with voice. But at least um, it doesn't, it's the visual stuff has not gotten rid of the ability to walk away from the device and complete tasks. Anchored experiences like a smart TV or a home computer, the customer is very likely to be in arm's reach of a controller or a screen. And so close proximity means these high density displays are supported like your laptop or your TV. And because of this voice that you're probably going to make the decision that the voice is supplemental due to the high visual load, uh, people are going to read faster in many cases than your, your uh, TTS is going to read. Uh, and it may feel like it's slowing them down. And so you're just gonna, you're gonna trim the prompts potentially. Uh, it's, a, it's a design choice. You may make other decisions, but that's kind of the way I've seen things trend. Um, you can make that assumption because you know that you're not cutting people off if they have to be near the TV to like appreciate the outcome. Like if the whole point is to watch the movie, they're not gonna start watching the movie, like not looking at the screen, not being near the screen. Uh, so you can get away uh, with, partial voice interaction because that you, you don't you don't you're not worried about that sort of wandering scenario. Direct experiences like smartwatches, Google Glass, they are the device is usually attached to or in direct proximity to the customer, which allows us additional ambient input sensors most of the time. Uh, and this also applies to like VR that's attached to the human it's like uh, to the head in most cases. Uh, some some VR some VR ends up being anchored. Uh, it kind of depends on the it, some things are a little bit fuzzy and it depends on how the implementation works. But uh, definitely, our uh, augmented reality falls into the direct experience category. These small constrained screens force low information density, especially for uh, augmented reality. Like if you've ever used the Hololens, it's not really a huge field of view and it's meant to be on top of what already exists and so you can't like you're not necessarily going to watch a movie on it it's going to add to what you're already looking at so we have to be smart about what information we're showing and we these these devices are usually pretty small so we have to be careful about uh what interactions we're asking people to complete uh we can't do super complex stuff and then intangible experiences, which I think everybody here is probably most familiar with. Customers rarely need near the device. You don't have to look at the device to interact, which is huge. 
uh, that means we can't rely on visuals in this category. Like you can have the LEDs on the device, but you can't assume that they're looking at them. Uh, so any information that's critical that's coming through the LED, you gotta get to people in some other way. Um, all interactions should be completable without physical interaction due to the lack of proximity. And you know, as we all know, lower information density because of uh, the differences in visual and acoustic processing in the human brain. So multimodal flows are used to show how customers transition between multiple modes of interaction. So to me, in my practice, this is all new, like th this is a spectrum again, like this is, there's no right or wrong way, but in my practice, uh, I've, I've seen three sort of things work out for me. One of them is a simple flow where you depict a single path through an experience with minimal branching possibilities. One of them is a triple flow, which depicts a few branching possibilities and makes it clear when each mod mod uh, modality updates. And the third is a set of swim lanes, which is best for situations when input and output are changing independently and complexity is kind of high. So I'll show you an example of each and we go into a little bit more detail in the book. But this is an example single flow for a single intent where I'm like selecting and playing an album. So we're, we're going sequ sequentially through the action. We're not focusing on a single modality. Instead, we're splitting, uh, you know, there's the you kind of splitting from a single state. Like I can either say, play this one or use a gesture click. Uh, so it's more of a state diagram than it is like a swim lane where we're separating out each of the different modalities. Um, it's, this one is more from the customer's perspective than a modality or device perspective. Um, what we did on Windows Automotive was what we called a triple flow, where we had a hardware lane, a, a, a sort of an acoustic speech lane, and a visual lane. And then we could show how each of these lanes interacted in parallel and saw see those choices change. Um, so that uh, that was help. This kind of stuff starts to be more helpful when you're communicating with uh, developers or when you're trying to figure out exactly like what UI affordances you're going to need. And then for some situations where things are really complicated, uh, multimodal swim lanes may be your best bet. In this situation, uh, the system logic lane is placed in the center. Uh, the output is on the bottom, and there's an. You can make as many swim lanes as you need. Like if you have multiple type, you know, three different types of output, for example, but in this case, uh, an audio output lane, a visual output lane, and then uh, input lanes, we have physical and audio. So this example is a streaming media device with a voice enabled remote. Uh, you're trying to do a movie search. And so there's push to talk interactions and, you know, sort of selecting a movie, but they can also just say like watch movie title to call up an individual search. And we can see there's both voice responses and visual responses happening in the context of this particular uh, th this particular interaction. And you can see the complexity. Uh, it gets it, the complexity ramps up pretty quickly. If we did this for every possible customer interaction in the system, we would never ship our products. So I am not advocating that you do this for literally everything in your system. You're going to have to use your judgment as a designer to figure out, uh, OK, uh, where are the most complex uh, problems? Where do my developers need the most guidance? Where are my customers going to run into the most interesting places? Where do they have the most choices? And how do we how do we lock those down? Uh, how do we figure out exactly how those should behave? In my book, I, but you'll also see in the slides, uh, you know, I've proposed, you can use whatever sort of visual language you want, but this is a visual language I have used in the past for my multimodal flows. Um, I use this one because I've used Visio a lot, and these shapes are all kind of uh, easily findable in Visio, but I focus on elements like customer driven transitions between modalities, system driven transitions between modalities. So focus on those transitions. If a scenario doesn't have transition between modalities, you're really just doing a modality specific design. Handoffs to other devices, major system state changes, or like major external events that are maybe gonna give your customer a choice of how they wanna interact. Uh, these flows are an additional deliverable for your customers, for your uh, for your developers, for your partners. They don't replace the work you're already doing. And keep in mind that intangible quadrant and the adaptive quadrant, they should always allow voice completion of tasks. The visuals can be additive, but you know they should never require visual interaction to complete the core scenario. Otherwise, you're really kind of behaving like you're assuming the customer is near the device. And that's 
um, you know, we're disregarding the customer's ability to walk away from the device in that scenario. You can do optional stuff that requires touch, but if you know the customer needs to set a timer and you're requiring them to touch, you're disregarding the customer's core reason for purchasing a device that, uh, that supports the ability to talk to it. So in closing, you know, to extend your voice designs for multimodality, consider what input and output modalities will you support? And to answer that question, you want to ask yourself what your customer's context is. What do they need? What makes sense in their environment? What do they already own? Where does your experience fall on that spectrum of multimodality? What transitions are going to be key in your experience? How will your chosen interaction model, like where you land on that quadrant, going to impact your design? Are you uh, do you need to have all of your scenarios completable by voice or can you do something that's a little bit more uh, screen forward? And which flows are most critical to document from a multimodal perspective? As I tell folks outside the software industry, I hope that like this book and this content will be the design manual for folks who want to design the bridge of the Starship Enterprise because they seamlessly move between modalities. You know, they're, they're using physical controls, they're speaking to the computer, they're using like holograms. Uh, and it, it's all seamless, but that requires a ton of orchestration and uh, intentional work under the hood. So somebody needs to build that. Will it be you? Uh, so the book is available from rosenfeldmedia.com or Amazon. A fun plug is that all the paper books on Rosenfeld's site come with the ebook version, which is a very good deal. Uh, and the book has four themes, customer context and ethics, multimodal frameworks, ideation and execution, and emerging technology. So there's a lot more than we talked about today. And this is you can look at this in the uh, in the slides, but uh, there's this is sort of how the chapters all line up into an end to end process. And this is a lot for one hour. I totally know. Uh, so apologies if it feels like it's going a little fast. I'm just so excited about the content and sharing some stuff with you so that even if you can't purchase the book, maybe some of these insights can help you. Uh, the reference materials are available without purchase. Uh, they are all available on my website, and if the URLs aren't working, you can just go to ideaplast.com and then uh, look, look for the book page, and that stuff is all there, along with a lot of podcasts about the content. And uh, virtual book signing, I will mail a signed book plate sticker to any VoiceFlow attendee. Just email your address to Cheryl at ideaplast.com. I don't use the mailing addresses for any other purpose. They get discarded, but uh, that is open to anybody who wants it. And uh, yeah, the sign education goodness, check out ideaplats.com. And I do do workshops, actually, Rona, ideaplats.com. Uh, thank you for the question. And may the voice be with you. And so we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I'll leave that up for a second and I'll turn over to the Q&A. And uh, so there was one question, where are the possible places to have a first-hand internship experience building a career in, and in uh, customer experience and conversational experience design. So, and it's fun because like, uh, I have a, oh, Emily would like to answer this question live. Emily is going to answer it. Oh, no, uh, it, it was all you. I was just, oh, I was see. putting it in the chat for you. <laughs> so um, one thing, so I have like a general thing, which is that uh, often people who are earlier in their career have better answers to this question because they have just gone through the process. I am an old fogey, uh, so I have not been as connected to the, the, like the getting connected piece. My personal take is that uh, it is often easier to find internships at larger companies. Uh, but, you know, so your Amazons, your Microsofts tend to have more established internship programs. The challenge with conversational design is that it's not like a hireable discipline. So to find something very specifically conversational design, you're super limiting yourself. So um, Emily may know of more. It's, I would say connect yourself to communities of affinity like this. Um, and you may find out about specific internships. Um, uh, find ways to do projects on your free time so that you have stuff in your portfolio, uh, you know, Alexa skills, etc. Uh, be open minded to taking on stuff that might be a little broader than conversational design, but might touch conversational design. Uh, certainly take a look at the Googles and Alexas of the world because those are the most likely to touch that stuff. Um, but you don't necessarily need to have an internship specifically in conversational design to have a successful career there eventually. I mean, the thing about it was the field didn't exist when I got started. Um, and it's uh, other people may have a different perspective on it, but I feel like 
I, I don't feel like conversational design is going to break so much off of UX that people are going to have to like go to school for it and train for it and have dedicated internships on it. I do think that there are more complex scenarios that like more complex needs that somebody with you know more experience is going to interview well into those. But I think if you don't get the experience right away, there will be more chances and getting a good basis in user experience will continue to help you. Uh, what was the worst idea for a voice or multimodal interface? Uh, worst idea, uh, see, I think nothing jumps out, like little examples for me jump out, like little bad design decisions. Like there's nothing that jumps out at me and says like they never should have done this. But like when we were testing the Cadillac Q, for example, which is an automotive system, and I'm like on a highway and I'm like turning on an off ramp and the system's still going and I'm, I just need to concentrate and I'm like cancel interaction and it's like, okay, canceling interaction and like that's that's not how we handle that's not how we handle high high stress situations It's like replying to the cancel with like a like an okay canceling interaction like the whole point of me saying cancel in that situation was I did not want any interruptions anymore I was like you know six 45 miles an hour hands on the wheel like needed the system not to be talking to me anymore um so I feel like that 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 principle jumps out at me like the more we get up to uh high risk situations, I, I feel like we've missed a lot of opportunities to pay attention to humans and their their current state, uh, their their current activity, their emotional state. That's a couple of the early chapters in my book talk about capturing human activity and using it as sort of an etiquette guide for your for your computer. Um, and so I that's that's kind of my take on it is that there's a lot of missed opportunity, um, but I haven't seen there isn't stuff that has jumped out at me as like, oh my God, we've offended people, except in movies. I <laughs> I still don't fully understand some of the minority report stuff yet. Like the contrast on a visual screen that floats in the middle of nowhere, I'm like, who wants to do that? That seems kind of terrible. There's no haptic feedback. You can't see anything. So that one might stick out in my head. Uh, can I share some other examples of other systems beside the ones we've seen in the quadrants? Uh, you know, it's I'm I'm thinking of starting like a like a multimodal meetup group or something because there aren't a ton of like there's it's early days for this space and so I'd like I want to gather more people to hear about the best practice systems like we're kind of at the cutting edge here uh, for uh, full interaction. There's a really great example in the book from Anna Bovian who used to work for uh, 3M and uh, it's about a multimodal system for doctors where uh, they're able to do voice dictation and then there are uh, there's there's these little devices with um, visual indicators that indicate when the system has an AI suggestion for a potential condition or uh, you know a sort of finding from what the doctor is dictating. And so there's a lot going on there. The doctor's dictating stuff, there's a visual of like what the dictation is, and then there's a secondary a piece where we're getting this other visual indication uh, and so we're getting there's visuals there's I think there's audio in, indicate uh, feedback at some point but uh, it's uh, the it, it the way Anna describes it it's very graceful they, they worked very hard to not interrupt the doctors terribly much uh, so I think that's it's a really interesting spectrum of considerations in that space. Like when do you interrupt people with sound in that situation? Um, when do you not? <laughs> when do you uh, like how many visual indications do you use? Where do you position them and how? Uh, you know, what relationship does the text have to the recommendations? There's and you know, it's inherently both cross device and cross uh, modality. So I think that one's really interesting to me as another uh, example of sort of a complex scenario. So let's, so thanks for the great questions. I know, uh, do I have any in workshops for individuals to join independent learning if we are not part of a work team? I am looking at scheduling one. I did have one, but then uh, the conference had to shut those down because they weren't getting, uh, they, they, you know, online, online signups can be tricksy. So I am looking at 
potentially setting one up at some point. Uh, if you're interested in workshops for me, I would recommend signing up for the Idea Platts mailing list because I definitely let folks on that let know first when those opportunities come up. I did launch a new multimodal design fundamentals workshop series this year. It's three three-hour workshops. Uh, it, it, uh, I have taught it to corporate clients, but I am looking for ways to get that out to individuals as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for the, the crazy amount of knowledge that you were able to pack up uh, in, in the last hour. And for everybody who tuned in, we will be sending out a recording of this in case you want to go back, uh, screenshot any of those bit.ly links. We will also be sending those out as well. Um, thank you again for everybody who joined. I'm just going to quickly share kind of our, our finale around here. So for anybody who is interested in getting the book, whether you head over to rosenfeldmedia.com, um, which will include that link as well in the follow-up email, or if you want to head over to Twitter, there's still a chance uh, for us to announce and potentially send you one uh, for just attending today. So please let us know what stood out to you. What are some call outs? What are some things that you guys want to learn? Uh, and thank you again, everybody, for joining. This was put on by our community. So if there's anybody in here that's looking to connect with other conversation designers, looking to figure out how they can learn or connect with other people, definitely check that out at bit.ly slash VF community. Um, and if you're looking to get started and play off from a kick from a kickstart point, definitely check out our templates. That is also a, a really great way of just getting your feet wet. And last but not least, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we have a bunch more events that are coming up. Hopefully we'll have some more featuring Cheryl in the future when she gets settled. Um, and if there's anything you guys wanna see, please let us know. And thanks again, everybody for joining. Thank you everybody. Have a wonderful day.